Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're going to continue our series dealing with financial planning for business owners. We are now on to number uh, 39 in our video. This is the first in a little three-part mini-series where we're going to talk about selling businesses and some of the discussions we have to have when we're selling businesses. The share sale is one of two methods that we have available to sell a business. We can sell the shares, which is what we'll deal with here, or we can sell the underlying assets, which is what we'll deal with in the next presentation. Selling shares is generally what the vendor or seller of the business wants to do. The biggest reason is usually the ability to use the lifetime capital gains exemption. This is going to put tax paid dollars into the vendor's hands. That means that they don't have to take money out of a corporation later on or whatever the case is to deal with their tax consequences. And it gets the corporation gone. We don't have to worry about maintaining a corporation anymore. We can remove that little bit of cost and complexity from our lives now. It also removes any liabilities. We're going to pull out the tax liabilities here because the seller, the vendor, has gotten rid of any potential future recapture of depreciation on business assets. If you're not comfortable with that concept, we're going to talk about that more when we talk about share sales in the next video. And we also remove any legal liabilities. And this is the question of, did your corporation ever do anything in the past that it might still get sued for? By getting rid of the shares of the corporation, we remove those two potential sources of liability. However, we can imagine, I'm sure, that there are two parties to this transaction. And as much as the vendor wants to get rid of these liabilities, that means that the buyer is buying these liabilities. I think just when I say it like that, buying these liabilities doesn't sound too good. And the buyer probably is not enthusiastic about this type of purchase. Now, if the share sale is being done by a holding company, then it's pretty much identical to what we saw on the last slide, except that a holding company, because it's not a person, cannot use the lifetime capital gains exemption. So no lifetime capital gains exemption available here. And now the proceeds of sale are still held in the holding company. They would still have to be paid out at some point as a taxable dividend to the vendor of the business. It is possible, and we had mentioned this quite a while ago, but it is possible to actually incorporate an unincorporated business really just for the purpose of using the lifetime capital gains exemption. If, if you've been running an unincorporated business for more than 24 months, and now you get an offer to buy, you can basically incorporate the day before you sell and sell the shares and then the buyer of the shares would be buying that incorporated business and the seller could potentially use their lifetime capital gains exemption. I've actually never seen this done. I say it's not done very often. I've never seen this done, but it is theoretically possible and it would be something at least worth considering. I think that I've already uh, maybe spoiled this a little bit, but the reality of share sales is that advisors are not going to advise the buyers of business to do this. If you have a situation where the buyer has any control, where the buyer can exercise uh, any sort of conditions over the sale, which is typical, then your advisors or lawyer or accountant or financial advisor, they're gonna say, no, don't buy the shares. You're buying all those liabilities I showed you before. Buy the assets, avoid buying those liabilities. And you can see then for the vendor that potentially wrecks their ability to use the lifetime capital gains exemption and saddles them with the liabilities. There are really only a couple of circumstances where you'll see share sales. And those are with vendor funded deals. That is where the buyer doesn't have enough assets on their own to make this purchase and needs some help. And the other is sometimes a big publicly traded company or a very large private firm, sometimes they want to make sure that they're getting everything. They want to make sure that there's no sort of stone left unturned in the business. And that's where it might be preferable 
for them to just buy the whole block of shares. And that can be good. The person selling the shares, the vendor then, really does get that little bit of win out of that. I'll show you how this works relative to Trashco. Let's say that we've had this situation where we have Alan and Bruce have never set up hold codes, but for whatever reason, Connie has set up a hold co. So we have Trash Co here, and we're going to sell Trash Co. Somebody comes along and says, I want to buy the shares of Trash Co. Maybe it's a much larger company, maybe it's a publicly traded waste management company, and that publicly traded waste management company offers six million dollars and Alan and Bruce and Connie figure that is more than worth their while. They can exit here, maybe they're pre-retirement and they're now starting to think about retirement. They sit down with, uh, again, their financial planner and they figure that that's the right amount to fund whatever their retirement objectives are in addition to whatever other savings they might have. For Alan and Bruce then, they're both in the same boat here. They're both selling $2 million worth of shares personally and they would both use the lifetime capital gains exemption. Assuming it's available, that they have that direct ownership, and they would end up with a capital gain of about, call it 1.1 or $1.2 million that they would have to pay tax on. That's a capital gain of about five. I guess we can actually, why don't we do the math here? I should probably do the math. We're going to have million dollars proceeds, knock off 850,000 of lifetime capital gains exemption. We can round off a little bit there. That's 1,150,000 of cap gains that we still have to deal with. We can get a 50% inclusion rate. And that's going to give us 575,000 of taxable capital gains and we might end up at a tax rate of somewhere around 50%. And that's going to be $262,500 of tax to pay. And that means that both Alan and Bruce here will have two million less 262,000, they would both have 1,737,500 net of tax. And that's all personally held. They could do whatever with that. Whereas Holdco sells its shares. It's also got $2 million worth of shares sold here. This is quite a bit more complicated. First off, it's a $2 million capital gain for Holdco which has no ACB, no lifetime capital gains exemption. Sorry, take our 50% inclusion rate here, and that gives us $1 million that is uh, taxable. Now, the upside here for Connie is she can pull out $1 million tax-free. She does have a $1 million CDA credit, and there's no reason she shouldn't do that. She takes that $4 million out and she has $1 million of tax paid money, but there's still a million dollars sitting here in Holdco that's taxable. Now you may recall that on that taxable portion, there are two components to this. We're gonna have about a 26% refundable tax rate and then about a 24% non-refundable tax rate. This 260,000, Connie can get back as she pays dividends out of the corporation. This $240,000 is really lost to tax. You can see that her sort of immediate tax bill in terms of the real tax paid is pretty similar to what Alan and Bruce had. Okay, pretty similar figures here, around 260. Uh, 
500 to that 240,000. The difference though, is that the $760,000 that Connie still has sitting in Holdco, she has to pay that out to herself as a taxable dividend. So her net amount here, which is $500,000 net of tax plus 260,000 of refundable uh, withholding tax, which will come out eventually. She'll be able to get that all out. But that portion, all that 760,000, she has to dividend to herself to get it out. So she's going to pay tax here that uh, Alan and Bruce didn't have to pay. Now she can time that as she wants and maybe she can uh, minimize that tax bill to a significant extent, but it still has to be taxed. There's not really a tax-free way to access that $760,000. You can see then that using the lifetime capital gains exemption did give Alan and Bruce a benefit as it should. Connie doesn't end up too far behind, but her tax rate on these dividends may be somewhere around 30 or 35 percent. She's going to end up with about 500 or so thousand dollars here. It, uh, it will hurt her a little bit to have gone this route. Okay, I hope that that helps to understand the uh, share sale that can take place in a business, whether we have a share sale where it's a person, Alan or Bruce, doing their sale, or whether it's Connie's hold co doing the sale and then the consequences for Connie. I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much. And welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're going to continue looking at financial planning for business owners. And just before we get into the video, I'll do a quick commercial here. We haven't seen this in a while. Uh, so I work at uh, businesscareercollege.com, and we only do training for the financial services sector. That would include the life licensing qualification program. Uh, we do core curriculum leading towards the uh, CFP certification. We also do a capstone course on that front and a bunch of exam prep. And we do a fair bit of continuing education as well. And then a bunch of other odds and ends, including uh, custom built courses for uh, internal training needs. We are now on to video number 40 in the series. And this video sort of couples up with the previous video share sales and then there's some overlap into the next video, uh, Corporate Valuations. Very nearly wrapped up the series here. If you do have anything you wanna see that would be sort of relevant to this that I haven't covered yet, I'm interested to know. Uh, there are some topics that uh, I'd be happy to add and others that I may have to defer to others to deal with. Okay, uh, so in the last video we looked at uh, share sales, now we're going to look at asset sales. And even though share sales get all the focus, asset sales are really by far the more common structure. In an asset sale, instead of a person selling the business, it's actually the corporation that's going to sell the business, assuming it's an incorporated business. And what'll happen here is proceeds are going to be paid into the corporation, which means that then they have to be paid out to the shareholder as a taxable amount. Uh, I had mentioned this in the last presentation, the biggest advantage here typically for the buyer is that they're not buying any tax or legal liabilities. They're just essentially buying a bunch of, call it used stuff, and any liabilities that accrue would only accrue from the date of acquisition. The uh, recapture of depreciation happens at the time of sale. Oh no recapture until the uh, later on the buyer who has depreciated an asset from that point sells that asset way down the road and their recapture of depreciation is all due to stuff they've done not due to something somebody else did uh, no opportunity to use lifetime capital gains exemption now it might be appropriate to crystallize prior to selling your assets and that gives you now effectively a holding company that has a larger ACB 
Uh, we'll touch on that concept in the very last video in this series. And that means, as mentioned, that you have to pull money out as a taxable amount, unless you happen to have some capital dividend account credits available, and you might generate some CDA credit as a result of the sale of the assets. We'll see that on the next slide. Uh, buyers will not want to buy uh, non-business assets here, so you're probably not going to have sort of hefty capital gains associated with things like uh, investments or whatever the case is. You may have capital gains associated with other assets. Again, we'll see that on the next slide. Okay, so I've sort of just made up some values here for Trashco, just so we can get a feel for this. Now, we absolutely need our accountant here. This is one that uh, without the accountant, we really can't make this work. So this all keys in on the accountant's advice. We're going to sell the four assets comprising the $6 million value of uh, Trashco. And it's actually Trashco doing the selling here. So Alan isn't selling anything, Bruce isn't selling anything, Connie isn't selling anything, and Connie's holding company isn't selling anything. Trashco is doing all the selling. So when it sells the equipment, we'll start with the equipment up at the top here. With the equipment, we have a fair market value at two and a half million. So the, we work with Norman and possibly with a certified business valuator, which I'll talk about in the next presentation. And we arrive at a value of two and a half million dollars for the equipment. And ACB is really irrelevant. Uh, with an undepreciated capital cost of 2.8 million, that means with the equipment, and you may need to go back and review the uh, depreciation video from way, way back early in the series. But anyways, with the equipment, we're going to have a $300,000 uh, terminal loss. Basically, we told Canada Revenue Agency that it was worth $300,000, or sorry, worth a uh, 2.8 million, but now we're only able to sell it for uh, one point, or sorry, for a 2.5 million. And then with the machinery, we're going to have a $100,000 um, recapture depreciation. Now some of that recapture will get wiped out by the terminal loss, leaving us with $200,000 of losses available to use once we've dealt with our um, depreciable assets. And then we're going to assign some value to the brand and to the customer lists. And this may or may not be how this works out in real life. This is a, a fairly complex area and this really relies on the buyer and seller arriving at sort of common understandings for what is being bought. But let's assume this is where we land. So with the uh, brand, we're gonna have a $500,000 capital gain. And with the customer lists, we're going to have a one and a half million dollar capital gain. Now there used to be some favorable tax treatment available around this kind of stuff. But really, other than the fact that it's a capital gain, we don't get much today. So in total, we're going to have a capital gain of $2 million. And we'll cut that in half. So 50% inclusion there. And that gives us $1 million that is taxable. Now we should be able to, and this is where we're going to need to lean on Norman, but we should be able to use this net loss here against this gain, knock that down by $200,000, and we'll have an $800,000 uh, taxable amount then, or net taxable amount. And as we've seen previously, we'll uh, tax that at two different tax rates. We'll tax that first off $800,000, at about a 24% real tax rate, and the other $800,000, or the other $800,000, we'll 
another $800,000 calculation, still the same $800,000 at a 26% refundable tax rate. So we're going to end up with, as far as real tax money that actually won't be available to us anymore, that will be $192,000 and amounts that will be refunded later on when Trashco pays taxable dividends would be $208,000. And then of course, because we have a capital gain here of a million dollars, we also have a capital dividend account credit of $1 million. So ultimately, in this particular case, Trashco sells $6 million worth of assets. It gets away pretty good. It only has $192,000 of tax to pay. Not much recapture here. That might not be an entirely realistic scenario. This would uh, depend on where we ascribe value. And I'll talk about this more in the next presentation. The, uh, the descriptions of the values here does have to be accurate. We can't just make up whatever we want. So we ended up with uh, six million dollars. That was our proceeds and really just that hundred and ninety two thousand dollars of we'll call that real tax to pay. We know we'll get the refundable tax back eventually because we have to pay those dividends at some point. So practically uh, sitting in trash go we have five million eight hundred and eight thousand dollars available to pay out. Now the challenge here and the reason we don't necessarily like an asset sale is that means to get that money out Alan, Bruce and Connie are at some point going to have to pay themselves taxable dividends. That'll act, that will actually be the topic of the very last video in the series when we talk about using the corporation as a retirement vehicle. Okay, I hope that helps. I know we delved into a little bit of tax stuff that we haven't done previously here, but nothing too complicated. And I hope that you've, uh, hope that you've learned something here and hope you uh, join us for the last couple of videos in the series. Thank you very much. And welcome back to the Business Career College video series. Uh, in this video, we're continuing our series dealing with financial planning for business owners. I've actually added a video to the series. So we're on video 41, Corporate Valuations, and I've decided to do the last video in two parts. I fear it's going to be a little bit long otherwise. So we have uh, still two videos left to go. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll cover that off in the next video. Right now, we're going to talk about corporate valuations. This can be quite a complicated topic, and I really just want to keep us to uh, principles here. We don't need to get into too much in the way of detail. Um, now, no matter what we say about valuation, in the end, a business, like anything else, is only worth what somebody will pay for it. In an arm's length transaction, that's fine. The price is the price. Basically, if you have two people who each have their own economic interest at heart, they negotiate back and forth and they arrive at a price, that's the price. And we're generally not going to have a challenge with that based on sort of those two people in roughly equal positions negotiating back and forth. Where we get into a little bit more difficulty is in non-arm's length transactions. And the challenge here is if you have a child buying a business from a parent, for example, that would be a non-arm's length transaction, then each of them doesn't have their own economic interest primarily at heart. They would often have uh, a shared economic interest. And this is where uh, sometimes CRA especially will have a challenge with the price that's arrived at, and we may have to apply some common valuation principles. Now, we talk here about valuation in terms of buying or selling a business, but the reality is that there are many circumstances when a valuation might be required other than just the sale of a business. So we see some of them here, uh, divorce of a shareholder. As we've seen previously, we might need to value the business in the midst of a separation or divorce so that we can do a proper division of matrimonial assets. Death of a shareholder, 
and the estate consequences that come along with that. Now that might result in a sale of the business, depending on how the buy sell looks. Uh, and, and we've seen before that a properly structured buy sell can actually remove the valuation problem from death of a shareholder, although we don't always want that. When we have any sort of employee arrangement where the employees either own shares in the business or get to take profits, then we may need to do a valuation from time to time. If we have a deemed disposition for tax purposes, uh, the most common would be a shareholder who becomes a non-resident and that can result in a disposition of shares of your uh, business. If we are going to raise capital, the um, entities that we're working with to raise capital will want evaluation. Sometimes the capital raising activity will actually create evaluation that might actually be that uh, arm's length transaction that I had talked about before, and that can actually create a valuation for the business. Uh, sometimes we do this for benchmarking or for performance purposes. This might be used to assess management performance, for example, or board of directors performance. Uh, personal bankruptcy, similar to divorce. Now we're going to, going to have to value that asset for the purpose of meeting our bankruptcy requirements. If you're leveraging the shares of the business, if you're going to collateralize or borrow against the value of the shares, that's going to require a valuation. And sometimes just straight up lending purposes, we're going to need that as well, even if there's not necessarily uh, a leverage specifically against those shares. Uh, estate freeze or estate planning purposes, we've seen this already, that we will need to figure out what the business is worth for figuring out what the tax liability and other estate outcomes will be at death, such as equalizing between, let's say, the kids who will inherit the business and the kids who won't. Uh, insurance needs analysis, that's very much related. Again, we look at what happens when you die. We need to put the proper amount of insurance in place to deal with capital gains, for example. That may require evaluation. And if we're uh, amalgamating or restructuring the business somehow if we're bringing in another business or moving some assets to another business or whatever type of restructuring we might happen to be doing. Now valuations used to be done quite often by accountants. Uh, I would suggest that that's generally not your best approach. There are situations when it would be acceptable to use a valuation provided by an accountant but we are seeing now this uh, certified business valuator as the sort of um, key designation on the valuation side, CBV. And it is the uh, sort of standard today. You'll find some accountants, either former or current real estate agents or former entrepreneurs, people who sold their businesses and had interesting experiences sometimes go on to take this uh, CBV. And that's what I would suggest you should generally be seeking out when you need a valuation, um, generally a CBV, a CBV valuation will be accepted by uh, CRA. They'll say, yeah, that's, there's some objective standards there. And there's a ton of information that goes into this. Uh, I've seen some of the CBV curriculum and they really go into depth on each different type of business. They categorize businesses accordingly by both size and sector and they come to uh, all kinds of valuation principles that apply to businesses in any of a number of different areas. Quite interesting, actually. Methods of valuation. Uh, fundamentally, there are two different methods that we can use. We can use either a cash flow based method or an asset based method. I'll start with asset based. It's the easier to understand. It's just the net assets of the corporation. So how much are all the assets? How much are all the liabilities? net that out and you'll get to your asset based valuation. This is more common in sort of asset heavy businesses, uh, businesses where you're more likely buying the actual ability to do this business. And this would be typical in let's say construction, uh, road construction businesses, for instance, or farming, farming is often an asset sale or an asset-based valuation. 
And I should clarify as I say that, that this, these principles can apply in either a share purchase or an asset purchase. It doesn't really matter. Uh, on the cash flow side, we can see then a bunch of other stuff happen here. And this would be more common where you're actually buying the ability to generate income, not the ability to do the business, but the ability to generate income. And here we'll look at any of a number of variables to consider. We might take a multiple of revenue. And in some industries, revenue multiples are the norm. Uh, basically, you're just buying whatever revenue the business generates. That's often true with businesses where customers have a high lifetime value, where uh, bringing on a customer is going to generate X number of dollars of revenue for that business into the foreseeable future. That's where you'll see revenue-based multiples. That is the best, that's the highest valuations you're going to get are those revenue-based businesses. Uh, EBITDA, EBITDA is a pretty common one, and this is what you'll often see in sort of, um, let's say medium-sized businesses, uh, sort of maybe the more successful businesses that you might deal with as a financial planner. And uh, EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, basically what this is, this is the bottom line uh, without any sort of accounting, uh, I don't want to say tricks, but I'm going to say tricks. Um, it's really how much extra cash flow did the business generate? That's really what EBITDA measures. And the thing with EBITDA is that the buyer really is often buying that, that free cash flow that the business generates. That's often their sort of desired point here. You might have a multiple of earnings. This is kind of the least desirable, but it's what sometimes happens. And then SDE, salary and discretionary earnings. This is generally the case with lifestyle businesses. So if you're buying, let's say, a little restaurant in a food court or that kind of thing, uh, maybe a convenience store, uh, lifestyle businesses tend to sell on SDE, and that is how much compensation in total did the owners take out of the business? So we would take salary, any dividends they happen to take, but then also uh, any benefits they took that might not have been salary or dividends, but other kinds of benefits and might sell for something like three times SDE. And it's pretty common actually with all of these uh, in small business to apply a three times multiple. And as businesses get bigger and bigger, and sometimes this applies to acquirers as well, when we get into larger businesses, and anybody that knows PE ratios, for example, know that on the stock market, when we get into publicly traded companies, then we're gonna see 10 to 20 times multiple for bigger companies. And <clears throat> we'll sometimes see, uh, Dividend yield used as a model as well here. Dividend yield says how much does a shareholder generate? This is typically used when you have somebody who's just buying a minority shareholder position. You have somebody who's going to buy 10% of a business, for example, inject some capital. You might look at their dividend yield. This would be probably not so much a financial planning exercise as a capital raising venture, but it's something to be aware of anyways as a different valuation method. And then finally, a discounted cash flow method. So discounted just means that we're essentially going to do a time value of money calculation here. And we would say, what are the future earnings of the business? This is, these are the ones we always hear about in the media. We hear about technology companies buying each other and they're often buying on earnings projections on the ability to generate future earnings. And this is a little bit speculative. Uh, what we often see here, this is done with strategic acquisitions. And some strategic acquisitions are also asset-based to be fair, but a strategic acquisition is where if you buy up uh, another business, that it's going to add some ability 
for your business to generate uh, revenue, often it's going to multiply your ability to generate revenue. And so that's where that discounted cash flow method uh, can come in. Now I've got, I said I don't want to get too far into particulars here, but I did do up a little bit of a chart just so you can kind of see. So I pulled the information we used um, in the last video. I pulled the assets that we did in the last video. And definitely with the equipment and machinery, what we did here would qualify as an asset based valuation. These are definitely asset valuations. And that's pretty clear. We just sold them for fair market value. And they might have been appraised accordingly. We might have had a qualified appraiser come in and appraise all that equipment. We might have just done a negotiation to arrive at that pricing. However, we did it. Now, keeping in mind that um, attaching values to these things does have tax consequences if we don't do this well. This is where CRA might have a challenge, even though this was purely a arm's length transaction, uh, we still want to get these right. So it, it may be necessary to actually hire a valuator to come in and value the equipment machinery here. Uh, with brand and customer lists, these are a little bit tougher. These actually probably are priced more on a on an earnings based or a cash flow based method. And hard to say exactly, but an acquirer might have looked at uh, EBITDA to an extent here. They might have looked at discounted future cash flows. Basically, by buying those intangibles, that brand and customer list, how far ahead is the acquirer like to, likely to end up? Now, this is what we would really see as a hybrid model. And this is actually pretty common, especially in businesses that have sort of a mix like this, where there's some business happening and some other stuff happening. So we would really probably identify with Trashco in particular, a hybrid model. And not surprisingly, there's not often a sort of black and white answer to these problems. It's often very, uh, uh, let's say, dependent on the circumstances. And just to see how this works, I really just uh, threw some revenue numbers in here, completely made this up. But this is how you would look at EBITDA, for example. So or whatever model. If we're taking a revenues-based, you know, let's say, for example, we're doing three years of revenues. Well, we can see that that would be 10.5 million times three, and that would be 31.5 million of value. Or if we're going to look at uh, three years of EBITDA, and it's not always three years, you'll find other multiples used, as I mentioned on the last slide, but let's say we're doing three years here. Well, our EBITDA in this case is a little bit uh, more difficult to calculate. We see taxable income at one and a half million, but we'll add back in that depreciation and taxes are already not included there. So we would have an EBITDA of two million or so and times three, that's six million dollars uh, valuation if we're just looking at EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And finally, if we're looking at uh, net income, then we just take three times 1.2 million. That's net income or earnings, and that would be 2 million times three, just a simple then $3,600,000. And again, what's somebody willing to pay for the business? I only show you this because you'll see all of these different uh, values used. You would not see salary and discretionary earnings used in a business this size. Typically, it would be more likely to use one of these other um, values. Okay, I hope that that helps to understand how uh, valuation work. Some of the basic principles here, as mentioned several times, you want to make sure to use a good qualified professional here to do this well. I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much. 
Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. Uh, in this video, we're going to have the last of our set of videos, or the last topic in the set of videos. It's actually going to be a two-part uh, presentation here, uh, dealing with financial planning for business owners. Before I get into the presentation itself, I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, Jim Sullivan, who instigated the whole uh, video series. Jim is our region director with Investors Group out in the uh, Cumberland Straits region. And then I also wanted to thank uh, Peter O'Neill, who's also region director with Investors Group. And Peter is in uh, St. John. And I know Peter's been taking a group through this series every uh, Friday. They've been uh, watching these videos and tagging along here. And I appreciate the uh, uh, impetus and motivation from both groups to get these done. The videos are a lot of work, honestly, and it's good to have some knowledge that people are actually using them. <clears throat> the second thing that I wanted to do, and I probably should have this with every video, but this set of videos in particular, I'm a little bit concerned about the level of uh, tax advice or the level of tax planning that we get into here, and I want to heavily disclaim this video, uh, these topics, while the financial advisor is going to be involved, the, the uh, tax accountant is an absolute 100% must with this type of topic. I would urge that as a financial advisor, you could be comfortable with some of this material, but you absolutely indubitably need the tax advisor. I hope that's a good enough disclaimer to keep me out of trouble. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at videos 42 and 43 then. The Investco as retirement planning vehicle. Why would we do this? Well, what's happened here is the corporation has sold its assets and now we have a bunch of cash sitting in the corporation. And the shareholders have a choice here. Do they keep the corporation intact and use the corporation as a retirement vehicle, or do they just dividend themselves out a bunch of cash and have that available to use personally? Why would we do this then? Well, first off, advantages, we're going to have more actual dollars to use. You don't have to pay tax to get those dollars out now. So we have access to a fair bit of cash this way, more than we will if we take it out and use it personally. The question really becomes then, when we take into account the flow through of dividends and capital gains, does this end up better off in our hands than if we took that money out personally and used it personally? Okay. We also like this because it gives us the ability to time our income. You don't have any RIF schedule or RIF minimums to deal with. You can match this. The next point can be a little bit difficult, but if your share structure was set up properly, now you might be able to uh, split income. Now, arguably, you could split income anyways if your share structure was set up properly because you would be pulling dividends out to both spouses, presumably it's uh, spouses, or shareholders of the business. Uh, disadvantages. You still have to keep the corporation around. You're going to have to file an annual tax return and an annual corporate return which might cost somewhere around a thousand to three thousand dollars. That's a pretty rough approximation, but somewhere in that range to keep the corporation around. Uh, the corporation is, I would suggest, more prone to being messed with by the government. Uh, we've seen this, of course, with the changes to passive income rules, which would have no effect on what I'm about to show you. By the way, the passive income rules limit access to the small business deduction, and uh, none of what we're going to look at in the following presentation uh, would be um, at all related to small business deduction. Uh, we have a disproportionate impact on old age security from dividend income as compared to other sources of income. The problem with OAS being that the uh, dividend income is grossed up and it's the gross up that actually affects your uh, old age security benefit. And owing to the new tax changes, uh, we do have a little bit more uh, tax tracking, sorry, tax tracking, some complexity here we have to track in addition to 
shareholder loan balances. They now have to track uh, two different refundable tax on hand accounts plus CDA credits. That might be a little bit of extra billing for the accountant, a little bit of tax risk there anytime we start to deal with these notional accounts. Uh, we'll look at this right at the tail end, but we have the potential for double or triple taxation in the estate. And interest income is quite expensive this way. You probably aren't going to gain any efficiency by using the corporation to generate interest income. Let's have a look at this in the case of Alan, Bruce, and Connie. And first thing that I want to look at here, we've got uh, five million. I rounded it down a little bit here just to keep a, a nice even number. So we've got five million seven hundred thousand dollars of proceeds after the sale of assets from Trashco, and that breaks out nicely into one million nine hundred thousand dollars each. for our shareholders. And the first thing that I want to look at, now we can just transfer that right up to Connie's Hold Co. That's no problem. If we did it that way, we would also have to pay a dividend out to Bruce directly and a dividend out to Alan directly. So that's uh, maybe not what we wanna do right away. We may want to give Alan and Bruce a chance to put holding companies in place so that they don't have to pay tax on that amount personally. But just to see how this would work out, uh, Connie's hold code would end up with its full $1.9 million. That would all transfer up as a tax-free intercorporate dividend. We should have no problem with the safe income rules here. That is properly trash goes after tax money. Uh, Alan, on the other hand, and Bruce would be in the same boat, will pay tax if he takes his money out personally on a dividend of $1.9 million. Now, let's use some New Brunswick tax rates here. And this is going to be quite expensive. Uh, ultimately, if we have income over $210,000 in the province of New Brunswick, the effective tax rate on dividends is about 48%, 47.75%. And it's graduated up to that rate, of course. You don't have to pay tax at 47.75% all the way through. The first $210,000 will be at lower rates, but a lot of it will be at rates in excess of 40%. So the uh, tax rate here, we're looking at, or sorry, with the $1.9 million, taxed at a rate of 47.75%. That's $907,250 of tax to pay. So we end up with just under a million dollars here. We would have net of tax if we take this all personally that means we're going to have $999,750 uh, net of tax available, which is uh, maybe not that exciting, maybe not sufficient uh, for Alan and Bruce to decide this is what they want to do. We could reduce that tax bill a little bit by spreading some of that out. And again, the ideal thing here would be to put a hold co in place and have a little bit of opportunity to manage this, which is really what we're going to look at in the following slide and in the next presentation following this. I, I just wanted to establish that it is fairly expensive to just take that money all out. You'll have a fairly hefty tax bill there. And this would be high. New Brunswick has pretty high tax rates relative to most other provinces, but it's not ridiculous, even your best case scenario, you're still looking at probably around 37 or 38 percent tax. Okay, let's look at how this might apply to Connie in particular. So she has taken that 1.9 million dollars and she's going to just sit on that in hold code here. That will form her retirement savings 
and she's the only shareholder of Holdco. We'll deal with a, a spousal situation in the next uh, video series, and, or in the next video, sorry. And now we wanna know what to do with that $1.9 million. Well, a nice uh, simple solution here would be to take that and invest in, let's say, corporate class mutual funds. And I do hear this recommendation quite a bit, this idea that we would invest this money in corporate class mutual funds within the corporation. It's generally going to work out fairly well. Uh, the advantage here, of course, we've got this $1.9 million invested, is that most of your returns here are taxed as capital gains. Let's say for the sake of argument that we make an 8% return in Holdco this year from our corporate class mutual fund. And let's say that that all is distributed as a capital gain. So we would have $152,000 of capital gains. And let's say this particular fund distributes all of its gains distributed, no deferral, and no return of capital, just to keep this nice and easy. Okay, all simple stuff. If this is what we end up with, and keeping in mind already that uh, Connie has nearly twice as much money to invest this way as if she had taken a dividend out, so this is paid into her holding company, which we could call Investment Co. or whatever the case is, and we're going to apply the 50% inclusion rate. This is a capital gain after all, and that's going to give us $76,000 is taxable. We should be recognizing right now then, the first advantage for Connie is that she does have a $76,000 uh, CDA credit, which would allow her take, of course, $76,000 tax-free uh, from the corporation. So the other $76,000 that's going to be taxable here, this is going to be taxed. New Brunswick, uh, which is the province we're using here, has an effective tax rate of 52.67%. That's the tax rate on passive corporate income. It's a little higher than in most other provinces, but some are as high as 54%, so 52.67%. Now, where that 52.67% comes from, it actually comprises two different chunks. We're gonna have, or three chunks, depending on how you look at it, but we'll do it easy here. 30.67% uh, refundable federal tax. So that's where we would take that uh, $76,000 times 30.67%, and that's going to give us uh, 230, oh, that's not right, sorry. Let's fix that. I think that was 23,000, I apologize. $23,309.20. Type the 20 cents off, we don't need that. So 23,309 of refundable tax. And in addition to that, we're going to have a 22% non-refundable tax. So $76,000 times 22%. That's non-refundable. That amount, the 22 plus 30.67, gives us our total then, amount of tax, that's $16,720 of non-refundable tax. Now, what Connie is probably going to do here, she wants to get that all back out. So the way to get that refundable tax back is to pay yourself a taxable dividend and that's going to be refunded at a rate of 38.33% uh, 
based on any taxable dividends paid. So those um, taxable dividends paid to those taxable dividends paid to Connie uh, would attract the refundable tax back into the corporation. This is really a timing issue, and I did go over this once before. So if we pay out the dividend, effectively we have $76,000. We know we're going to lose 16,720 of it. Uh, that's lost to tax. So really we have $59,280 available to pay as a dividend. Assuming we're going to actually pay that 16,720 to tax right away, you could actually wait and just plan to pay that at tax time. There's no withholding tax or anything like that here. But I pay that amount as a dividend, that attracts up to a 38.33% refundable tax. That's going to give us Uh, $22,388, almost all of our $339 of refundable tax payable here. Almost all of the refundable tax that was collected up here is paid back here. We end up with about $1,000 of refundable tax that's not refundable right away, but at some point, uh, Connie's likely to take more of this original capital out of hold code, and then she could get that refundable tax back. In effect, this 22,339 of refundable tax would have never been paid. Her tax return would show that she paid this uh, $58,000 dividend, and that $58,000 dividend would attract most of the, the refundable tax payable back into the corporation, which really means that the net amount she pays is just what's over the 22,339 up to the 23,309. If you want, I guess we can do that up. That's uh, $970 of refundable tax that's not recovered yet. It should be recovered eventually. Now, the other thing to consider is what kind of dividend is this? So when Connie takes out this dividend, what is it? This dividend, because it's not income that was generated by or at the corporate general tax rate, it has to be paid out as a non-eligible dividend income or dividends can only be paid out as eligible dividends if they are related to dollars that were taxed at the corporate general tax rate. Okay, that's Connie using uh, corporate class mutual funds. And we can see a few different things happening here. She's going to have a relatively small amount of personal tax to pay because the only uh, taxable dividend she's taking out is the 58,280, plus she's got the $76,000 CDA credit over here. Now this assumes that we can find a corporate class mutual fund that actually uh, has these tax characteristics. One of the things that I would point out that might be a weakness here is with corporate class mutual funds, we're really relying on the fund manager to uh, sort of run the fund the way that works the best for us. But this would be fairly um, efficient for Connie. And the other thing to consider here is these non-eligible dividends, they're going to be subject to a 1.16 uh, or a 16% gross up. for the purpose of the OAS calculation, it's going to keep her on side. She won't get off side for uh, OAS, but it is something to uh, reckon with anyways, if she's old enough for that to be a concern. And that's uh,
just under seventy thousand uh, dollars of net income, sixty-seven thousand six hundred and five dollars. The OAS clawback starts at about seventy-five thousand dollars of income, so not a big deal. And then, of course, the dividend tax credit would come in later on, and that's where that's where we would reduce that accordingly. Uh, in New Brunswick, if she's only taking fifty-eight thousand two hundred and eighty dollars, she's at about a twenty-seven percent effective tax rate on those dividends. Okay, so that's uh, using corporate class mutual funds for Connie. Now I know we're running a little long here, uh, but I will show one other scenario with Connie, and that is what if she were to take that $1.9 million and not use corporate class mutual funds, but rather invest in a dividend paying. So we take the $1.9 million and invest in a dividend paying Canadian stock. So straight up dividends, and let's say for the sake of argument here, we get a 4% uh, dividend yield, so 4% on $1.9 million, that's going to be $76,000 of dividends. And these are all Canadian dividends. Uh, if they're foreign dividends, you don't get the same treatment. If they're foreign dividends, then you're going to have them just taxed as uh, ordinary income. But because they're Canadian dividends, they would just have a straight flow through. They would attract a 38.33% withholding, or sorry, refundable tax, but also a 38.33% refund when paid out. So this is the other thing that Connie could potentially do is take this uh, $76,000 of dividends and just pay it out straight to herself. This would be paid now as an eligible dividend. And that uh, eligible dividend treatment is going to result in about uh, an 11% tax rate, maybe a little less, around 10% tax rate. And that's because that money was previously taxed at the corporate general tax rate. That's, they were uh, Canadian securities here, uh, taxed at the corporate general tax rate. So she's got very little tax to pay here. And we could look at uh, similarly the effect on OAS. And this time you do have a larger gross up, that's $76,000 times 1.38 this time. And for the purpose of OAS clawback now, we end up a little bit worse off. We end up at $105,000 or thereabouts, which is going to result in her losing a fair bit, about 60% or so of her OAS benefit if she's old enough to collect it. Now, the other thing to consider is we've only done income here, assuming these are any sort of appreciated securities or appreciating securities. We have the additional upside of later on being able to redeem them. and take CDA credits at that point, depending how much growth there is. So that's sort of just managing income flow from the hold code. We looked at either using capital gains from a corporate class fund, and I wanna point out that while well, that was substantially more favorable, I also used an 8% rate of return there. Really, in that case, we were stripping both growth and income out, whereas here, I used a 4% dividend yield and it resulted in less income, which of course makes sense, but the thing to recognize to get to a more apples to apples comparison is you would still want to take into account 
whatever appreciation happens on these securities. And we'll sort of cover that off. We'll cover off uh, capital gains in the corporation in the second video in this series. I hope that that's a good starting point and I hope you uh, enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much. And welcome back to the Business Career College video series. This will be the last video in this series. This is video number 43 using the Investco as retirement planning. And again, I want to, because the last video, thank uh, Jim Sullivan and Peter O'Neill for your support through this. Much appreciated. And uh, hopefully we get something going in the near future as a second set of videos in a series like this. Not, uh, not right away though. Uh, again, I want to heavily disclaim this video. This is not tax advice. This is general information. If you need actual tax advice, you need to talk to professionals. Some of the concepts in here we're going to talk about, you would want to deal with a financial planner for. Many of them you would need to deal with a good tax accountant for. And at least one thing that we're going to see in here, you would need an actuary for. Nothing in here is going to be uh, useful on its own. You'll need the appropriate professionals. So we saw this last time. Uh, we have a corporation that sold its assets and now we have a bunch of cash. And the shareholders now can choose to keep the corporation intact and use the corporation as a retirement vehicle. Okay, we saw that last time. We saw some of the advantages and disadvantages of doing this. And I know the list of disadvantages is longer, but I actually am a fan of this strategy. In the end, the fact that you have more tax dollars to use is a big advantage. And I would suggest it outweighs some of the disadvantages we see on the uh, right-hand column here. Again, we went through this structure last time where we had $1.9 million. We already dealt with Connie and Holdco. We are going to see Connie again here in the very last slide. But uh, as far as income goes, We'll deal with Alan and Bruce, we'll cover them off. And then we'll look at Alan. Now I wanna work through a little bit of a fictional scenario here. And really I just want to do this so that we can see the impact of Tossie rules. So in this scenario, let's say that Alan had already established a hold co. Okay, so we'll retcon this back, we'll put a hold co in place, and that he had set this up so that Amanda was a 50% shareholder, or maybe 49%, whatever, we'll just give it 50% here. I know some people with their spouses would prefer 51-49. Let's just keep it at 50-50 here, and work like that. Now, this is not that easy to do. We would have had to really set things up well from the beginning, for this to be true, very difficult to set Amanda up as a shareholder afterwards. But the reason I show this is so that we can see that there is a strong benefit to going this way. We've got this $1.9 million invested, and now we can actually take dividend income for both of them. So instead of, let's say for the sake of argument, $100,000 a year of dividends, which would be taxed at approximately a tax rate of around 35%. Uh, Instead, we can do $50,000 each of dividends per year and have that taxed at a rate of around 27%. And that's obviously a big uh, tax savings, quite a strong advantage there. So that's potentially worth uh, considering. And then, so let's assume that we're doing some of that. The other thing that I wanted to, oh, and the other thing I should mention here is that this works. We don't have any Tossie here. Tossie will not apply as long as we have Alan is over the age of 65 or 65 plus. 
then TOSI definitely does not apply. Other than that, look back to the TOSI flowchart and we can see whether TOSI applies or not on that basis. But definitely, if Alan is 65 plus, we can run this Holdco as, in, as a retirement vehicle and really uh, get good income splitting benefits here. Under the age of 65, that becomes a little bit more complicated and we may not be able to split income on a beneficial basis. Now, the other thing that I wanted to show in this scenario is the purchase of life insurance in the Hold Co. And this is actually not a bad way to go if you don't need the money right away. Now, there are ways to leverage life insurance. I don't want to get into uh, leveraged life insurance strategies, but it is possible. We should acknowledge that it is possible to have hold co purchase life insurance and a variety of leverage concepts would allow us to access that money either within the corporation or personally. Those are fairly complex structures and I don't know that I would be comfortable presenting them in a video here. There's some tax risk if they're not well done and some risk overall if they're not well done. So let's just look at a, a plain vanilla purchase of life insurance and let's say that Hold Co. maybe buys a joint and last policy. We do a joint and last to die whole life policy here on both Alan and Amanda. And whatever it happens to be, let's say that we pay uh, $30,000 a year in premiums, doesn't really matter. And for that, we probably are going to get a death benefit of maybe somewhere around, it depends how old they are, let's say for the sake of argument, that we're going to have a death benefit of a million and a half dollars. That should be about right if they're sort of in their 50s or maybe early 60s, thereabouts. And so we run that, uh, that policy that way. The premiums are not deductible, but what we're doing here is we're building up a cash render value, which we're probably never going to use. We're probably building a death benefit. And this is really the win here, is that one day, Alan or, sorry, when Alan and Amanda have both died, now we're going to have a, a death benefit paid into Holdco. And when that death benefit is paid into Hold Co, that will create a CDA credit. And the CDA credit is based on the amount of death benefit less the ACB for the policy. Now you will wanna get some good tax advice about ACB for the policy. Uh, there are some concerns with joint policies and ACB today. So we wanna watch that a little bit, but it is distinctly possible if Alan and Amanda live long enough, the ACV could be very low, even zero if they live long enough. And that could give you a very generous CDA credit. We've seen that CDA before, of course, that allows you to take that money tax-free out of the corporation. And that could form an estate for Alan and Amanda's heirs, or it could be used as a charitable donation, whatever they're seeking to accomplish. Uh, the point is that they've been able to use, remember we said that larger amount of money, they were able to keep it in the corporation and now buy a life insurance policy with all that extra money and then use that to build some sort of a, a legacy. Okay, and that works reasonably well. In this case, there's really no reason not to hold life insurance in the corporation. Holdco probably doesn't become subject to claims of creditors. There does have to be a legitimate tax reason to hold that insurance in there. We probably would call that a key person need. Again, you're going to need some good tax advice around that. Uh, for Bruce, we're going to do something a little bit different. Bruce actually, let's say, never set up a holding company, never took money out through a hold co, nothing like that. 
he's just going to take his money straight out of Trashco. Now we said that was going to be very expensive and it's kind of going to be the case, but we're going to do this a little bit differently. We're actually going to have this go to fund a retirement compensation arrangement for Bruce. Now, when I say this is expensive, what's actually going to happen here is we're gonna pay a 50% withholding tax. And I will caution you that you need an actuary to set up the RCA. You can need good tax advice, you need good actuarial advice. These are complex arrangements. They have all kinds of specialized requirements, but this is something we can potentially do. So we pay a 50% withholding tax, that means there's $950,000 that's not in the RCA, that's in a non-investment earning account. with CRA, but that tax is all refundable. And this is different. If Bruce had just taken that out as a dividend, he would have paid about 50% of that, 47.75% of that as tax, and that would have been gone. This time, he's gonna have this $950,000 in the RCA and $950,000 held back by the Canada Revenue Agency. So that's a $950,000 RCA. And what happens now is that gets invested. And you have to be careful here, any taxable returns generated by those investments would add withholding tax into the RCA. We have to give half of any taxable returns here. So this is where maybe you invest using corporate class or you invest using the CSV of a life insurance policy. If you're going to do that, generally you're going to have the cash surrender value held within the RCA and the insurance policy elsewhere. So we've got this uh, $950,000. And what happens now is as Bruce takes income, it's taxable to Bruce, taxable is ordinary income. Now keep in mind that if he had taken a dividend, dividends paid to Bruce would have been taxed at somewhere around, if he'd just taken the full nine or 1.9 million, dividends would have been taxed at about 47.75%, or at least at the top end of that, a lot of that would have been taxed at that very high rate. Now he's going to spread that income out. So let's say for example, he takes, somewhere between, let's say 70 or $80,000 a year. In New Brunswick, that only puts him at a 35% tax rate. Fairly manageable. And he could actually make this work quite a bit better. And then whatever he takes out, let's say he takes $80,000 just for the sake of argument. We generate a 50% refund from that withholding tax or from that withheld amount, that's $40,000 that now comes from CRA to the RCA. This is where you need the actuary. You need to make sure that this thing is structured in such a way that we don't trap a bunch of dollars in that withholding account. We'll get that out eventually. Now, the real benefit here would be, let's say that Bruce decides that he doesn't want to retire in New Brunswick. I can't imagine why anybody would make that decision, having never spent any time at all in New Brunswick in the winter. Um, and he decides to retire to, let's say, uh, Florida. And now he's going to take income from the RCA as a non-resident and that's going to be taxed at just 25%, assuming he doesn't file Canadian tax returns that he just pays his withholding tax. That can be quite advantageous. Again, you want to consult good tax advice on this and make sure that this actually works. But the RCA forms sort of an interesting home for the proceeds of sale of the business 
and we can really get rid of Trashco now. We can just set up the RCA and we don't need that corporation around anymore. I would be cautious with the RCA. As you can see here, it's a little bit complicated. You do need that good advice, but it can work out nicely. Okay, and the last thing we'll look at here is what happens when Connie dies? So you might remember that we had Connie uh, keep her proceeds in her holding company. And let's say now we're way down the road and she, remember, was using some corporate class funds. So she would have kept her ACB low and maybe drawn some return of capital at some point. And maybe she had good tax deferred growth that she didn't need much of. So when Connie dies, she's got an ACB of a million and a fair market value of two million for the holdings she has in Holdco and her personal ACB for her shares of Holdco, she's never done anything to change this for the sake of argument here, is still zero. And this is where we're going to see a little bit of a tax problem because now Connie dies. And when Connie dies, the first thing that happens is we have a deemed disposition of her shares. And the value of her shares now is going to be $2 million. That's going to be a $2 million capital gain, assuming she doesn't have a surviving spouse to roll this over to. It's a $2 million capital gain on her terminal tax return. That's the first thing. Uh, the second is now her estate has to actually get the money out of Holdco. So it has to first redeem the investments held in Holdco. And that's going to result in a $1 million capital gain for Holdco. Now we know that that also generates some uh, CDA credits. So there'd be a half million dollar taxable capital gain there. We'd really end up losing around uh, $250,000 or so here to, sorry, around $125,000 to tax. And now we have to take out a taxable dividend. That money is still trapped in Holdco, our net proceeds here, which are going to be approximately, and we'll call it 1.75 million, still in Holdco. And now we have to take that out as a taxable dividend. We know some of it can come out as a capital dividend. We'd have a $500,000 capital dividend from the previous transaction. The rest of it would be having to come out as a taxable dividend. And this is where we get a triple taxation. We really paid tax three different times here. We paid tax number one, when we had the deemed disposition of Connie's shares, we paid tax number two, when we had the investments held in Holdco, and we had tax number three, when we got to the dividends coming out here. So it doesn't necessarily mean a lot of tax, but that triple taxation can be a little bit frustrating. One of the things that we could have done to prevent this or to reduce the effect of this was to have Connie do a freeze earlier. Could she have done a freeze at some point? And possibly if she had frozen while Trashco was still around, she'd have a nice high ACB now. And at least then this first bit of tax wouldn't be so painful. That's one thing, that's one reason to do a freeze earlier rather than later. Now, I'm not going to get into it here, but the solution that some tax professionals would provide here would be a pipeline plan. And the pipeline planning, basically we create a new corporation and then we do a little bit of a shuffle of assets here. And it is possible to mitigate some of the taxes here. You're better off to have a high ACB, but if you don't, then we can use a pipeline strategy at death. Okay, we've covered an awful lot in this video series. I hope you've learned a few things, uh, maybe enough to be dangerous. And on that note, I've, uh, I think, cautioned it maybe too much in this video, but 
I would highly recommend the use of good professional tax and planning advice. I hope that uh, you've learned something and I hope you join us for future videos. Thank you very much.